Uh, thank you very much for attending here. My talk is about fossing for worms, or about, uh, in other words, about um, AFL for Linux network servers. So, is this working? Yes, somehow. No. Well, Murphy's Law. So, so uh, I'm Dolby Nutzhauser. Fuck. <laughs> Desynced. Sorry, I will fix this quickly. Okay. My name is Dolby Nutzhauser. I work at Compass Security. Uh, I gave several uh, talks previously, but on a smaller size of audience. I'm also a lecturer at the uh, Berner Fachhochschule. Some students are here. Very good. They followed my call. So I will talk, I will be talking about fossing. First, uh, what we currently have, which is basically mostly file-based fossers. Then a bit what I wanted, and this is a network fossor. I will try to my, make a live demo. I will talk a little bit about feedback-driven fuzzing and discuss the results afterwards. So uh, who knows about AFL, American Fuzzy Lop? Uh, it's about one third, very good. So on the left you see here, um, that's how you set up uh, American Fuzzy Lop, AFL. Uh, it's a file fuzzer. Uh, here uh, we are fuzzing bin utils, or uh, to be precise, redelf. So all you have to do is have the source code of the application you want to fuzz, uh, compile it with the AFL compiler, then uh, give an example file. This is here in the example direct uh, in the AFL in directory, and then start fuzzing. So uh, AFL is probably the most known fuzzer and uh, most widely used in the previous few years. And I think this is mostly because it is very easy to use. So everyone can start very quickly and it's giving useful feedback if you did something wrong, if you have some wrong settings or uh, configured it not correctly. Um, it's also very fast. It's usually about like 2,000 iterations per second. And it also has uh, code coverage feedback, which I will be talking about later. So um, AFL is out in several years right now, and everything is basically already fast. We have all the JPEG file parsing libraries, we have SQLite, we have um, uh, even some network servers, we have TCP dump and Wireshark, and we have like 1,000 uh, different auto tools where AFL found vulnerabilities. Um, so I thought, sad Pepe, everything is already fast. Isn't there something which uh, which is maybe possible to um, which is not fast already so much. So then I light my eyes on fuzzing network servers. This seemed to be a nice little niche where it's not so much development already. So when I mean fuzzing network servers, then I mean fuzzing the data layer. So I'm not fuzzing TCP or IP or Ethernet or whatever, but really application data. Um, one example for is um, MQTT protocol. I intentionally took this example, why you will see later. MQTT is often used in um, IoT frameworks and IoT devices. It's basically just a publish subscribe protocol. So you can like subscribe to a temperature channel and the devices push the temperature and then you receive it. Um, this MQTT protocol has like three basic messages. One is connect. This is the first packet sent to the server, uh, more or less with the name of the client. Then you can subscribe to a channel and you can publish a message to a channel, which is pretty simple and easy. Um, 
So basically, the MQTT server has a state machine, and it's looking for packets. And if it receives the connect packet, he knows are uh, now in the state connected. He's uh, receiving another packet, maybe subscribed, and he's handling this. And we want to fuss this uh, MQTT server. Uh, what possibilities do we have to perform this uh, fuzzing? I invented two um, words for this, the, or two methods. Uh, the first method I call wrap, and the second method I call rewire. And I will talk very quickly about these two methods. Um, so the first method, the wrapping, is basically just to isolate the functionality which is performing the parsing of the MQTT packet in this case. Uh, but usually this comes from file parsing. Maybe we have a function in Word or whatever called uh, scan docx file for viruses. And then this function we are able to fast and only this part and ignore all the rest of the application. This is uh, how we how it is done in libfuzzer and WinRFL and also in AFL persistent mode. This is uh, usually very, very fast. Uh, the sec or to discuss a bit the problems, um, as you can see, I wrote here parse MQTT packet. Of course, uh, this doesn't exist in the actual Mungu server. It's way, way more complicated and it's not isolated function like this, but it also generates answers, tries to set up networking. So this was not really applicable when I wanted to fuss uh, Mungu's MQTT server. So the second method I call rewiring, and the, this comes from the fact that in uh, Unix, a uh, network socket is basically just a socket. Here it has the number four, so it's just an integer. And the program reads and writes to this socket and the packets go out and arrive at the client um, socket. So it's easy to see that we can just replace this network socket with a file socket. Uh, because then we are able to use AFL again, just write all the network packets into a file and tell the MQTT server, hey, no, you are not reading now from the network, but from this file. Uh, there's a library which helps doing this called Preeny, which has a DSOC capability. Uh, I tried this library at Mungu 6.8 and it didn't work for hours and hours, so I was getting angry. And I uh, made, I made it manually and I made the uh, rewiring basically so that uh, Mungoose is reading from a file and not from the network sockets. I fussed it with AFL and also got very quickly a stack based buffer overflow. Um, fun fact, I finished the uh, exploit for this on my flight to DEF CON in this 10 hours. It was a bit more complicated than I thought. It was like a buffer underflow um, but what I realized here is that it's, it took several hours of, and, uh, of patching and debugging until I had Mungus that it was possible. So I wanted to make this a little bit easier. Uh, other problems, as maybe some of you already thought about when looking at my slides, is that if we just write the packets into a file, and mutate the file, uh, the fuzzer has no idea where the packet delimiters are or what are the different packets. So it will just look at it as a file, like a JPEG file, for example, and mutate it. Uh, basically flip bits and look if looking if the target is crashed. The target server will also read these uh, packets and maybe send an answer but this answer is going nowhere. The fuzzer like AFL doesn't read from the file. It doesn't have a concept of this. And this can or cannot, or can be a problem, but doesn't necessarily need to be. 
So this is like a suboptimal solution to use a file-based fossil to fossil network server. Is there a better way? And yeah, yes and no. Um, there's another type of fossil called uh, generational fossil. Basically, you specify the protocol you want to FOSS in an XML or something similar, byte for byte, um, when what does the first packet contain, what does the second packet contain, how does it look like, and once you specify the protocol, in this case FTP, um, then the fossil will smartly generate invalid packet, but still more or less according to the specification. <coughs> There are several of these fossils. Mo probably the most famous is SpeechFoss. They also made a company around it and implementing all these protocols. They call it XML PITS. So they implemented FTP and um, email and web and probably pretty much everything, even MQTT. But you have to pay for it. There's also BooFoss, which, which is uh, based on Solly, which is again based on Spike, where you define the protocol in Python, more or less, and you have tools like NetsOB or Pulsar, which should assist you with this reversing and re-implementing the protocol. Um, but I wanted to FOSS, for example, MQTT, but I haven't found um, any implementation freely available which I could use one of these fossils. Then I wanted to FOSS an IRC server, and it's the same, like there is no central repository of this um, protocol specification, which I can freely use to do my own FOSSing. So uh, this was about generators. And I realized one important distinction um, about network protocols is that you can um, split them into stateless and stateful protocols. The stateless protocols, which are surprisingly many, like DNS, DHCP, and HTTP, you basically just send a packet to the server, he answers you and forgets you completely. Every request is completely independent of the previous one, mostly. I think these um, stateless protocols can be fast pretty good with a file-based fossil because uh, you put the HTTP request into a file, fuss it, send it to the server, and do it again until the server crashes. But there are also stateful protocols, like uh, the example was MQTT or TeamSpeak or whatever, where there is a TCP connection with several packets depending on each other, like the TCP session is kind of like a session. So for the stateless protocol, protocols uh, before I created fossing for worms, you could use AFL, and for the stateful protocols, Peach was basically the best um, way to fuss it. But I'm very lazy. I don't want to patch uh, network servers. I don't want to XML protocols. I just want to perform some fuzzing. How hard can it be? So uh, last year, I think after DevCon, I uh, started to implement FFV, Fossing for Worms, and basically to apply the AFL approach of mutating packets um, into network services. So what are the steps of FFV? Uh, first, I intercept some package. It's basically like providing a an example file, like a PDF file, if you want to FOSS Ocrobot with AFL. Then I replay the data, which I intercepted with some modifications, the actual fuzzing. I detect crashes in the server, and at the end maybe uh, make some money with zero days or CVs or whatever. So I make the first demo, praise the demo gods. And I will um, reproduce the Mongoose MQTT 6.8 uh, vulnerability. 
Um, so the Mungo source code I downloaded into Mungo's and checked out the correct version. I compiled the example server of Mungo's MQTT broker, that one, and copied into the binary directory. I also have a configuration file for fuzzing for worms, which basically just specifies, uh, let's make it a bit bigger, uh, where the target is, the binary name, and how I give the target um, port and what is the default port. Uh, then let's intercept some packets. Packets. Uh, so I start the interceptor. It's now listening on port 10,000 and forwards all the packets to the destination server. I downloaded this cute little MQTT client. I already prepared the connection. So me as a security analyst, I have no idea about MQTT, just know it's a bit publish subscribe. So let's subscribe to the topic area 41 and maybe uh, publish something there, test. So this uh, appears to look good, um, send some example messages. Uh, fine for me. And FFV now stored this packet, packets in a pickle file. Um, okay now. So this is basically just, uh, could also save it in JSON, just the data which was transmitted. So here's the MQTT connect packet with my name. Here is the subscribe request and the server answers something like, yeah, you are now subscribed. And I was like posting test to this um, topic. So it looks reasonable. Um, then one important step, not here, but usually is to test this recorded data. So now I uh, replayed this data 32 times and it worked all the time, so this looks like ready for fuzzing. And I start this like this. So after a few seconds, we already identified some crashes. Um, this vulnerability is in the length field of the MQTT packet. Uh, if it's below two, then it's a buffer underflow, and I think it mostly detects this vulnerability. So I'm fussing here with two threads, about four iterations per second. Um, all the crashes or the data which generated the crashes is stored in the directory crashes, as you can see here. And it's basically the same um, data structure. So it's the data which we recorded and somewhere we did some fuzzing. Yeah, this is the message too. So FFV modified something on this mes message and this should have led to a crash. Sadly, Mungoose is very unre unreliable. It uh, stops accepting connections after like 20, um, connections. So I restart it like every 10 connections, but then it detects a crash every 10 connections because when you kill it, then that rest sanitizer will detect that the buffer is not freed. So we are lucky. The first one is a crash and the auto is not really. And let's start this. The server in uh, in the in a GDB and replay the file which generated the crash. So this was the one five zero five. So 
So, and we see in the GDB, it really generated a crash, obviously, because I verified it. So now we have the zero day, which is not again zero day, because they patched it in Mungoose 6.9. If that is looking quite unimpressive, I basically achieved my goal. It should be uh, very easy and without much trouble to uh, find vulnerabilities in network servers. So the FFV has several stages. The first you have seen, we intercept the network data. It's also possible to just capture it with like TCP dump and convert the PCAP to the pickle file but usually I just intercept it on the fly. Uh, we test it, if this intercepted stuff really works, we force it a bit, we verify, so we don't, so we remove the false positives. Then at the end we minimize it, because if you have 10,000 um, crashes, then you want to know the unique ones. And at the end I wrote the web GUI, uh, maybe I can show it which is now a bit work in progress, where you can uh, browse all the crashes, which can be quite large, and have all the data, and to start writing an exploit, if you have enough time. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, here we have the normal client, our um, graphical MQTT client. This was thinking it uh, communicates with the server, but it was communicating with fossin for worms and it wrote all the data into a file. And then afterwards we imitate the client, we read the file, read all the packets, select one of the client packets and mutate a little bit and then send it all to the server, which means we create a TCB connection, send the first packet, read the answer, send the second packet, read the answer until it's finished, and then we do it again with an mutation. Uh, maybe some of you guys are asking, uh, how is this like mutation performed? And I can say, I don't care very much, I'm just using Radomsa, everyone is using Radomsa, uh, Radomsa is what many understand as a fossil. It takes some data and it mutates it and then we have some different data and it's uh, very smart. It detects like XML and other file formats and it's doing smart stuff. So it was not, uh, it was not necessary to develop something from my own. Just use Radomsa like everyone. One interestingly hard problem was to uh, detect the crashes. So if we send a, a smartly fast packet to the server, which makes it crash, and then ask the process, hey, are you alive? Then it was always saying, yeah, I'm alive, uh, instead of being dead. I think in Linux you have some kind of lag or latency until the process is really... Um, identified as crashed, which was very annoying at the beginning. So I thought of a much smarter way to identify crashes, and it's basically just if I cannot connect to the server, he's probably crashed. Um, and if I cannot connect at the TCP handshake, the um, first data, the iter previous iteration probably caused the, the crash. And if it's crashing after or uh, when I send a mutated packet, and it's probably because of this packet. So this was uh, quite, an, quite an important distinction to be made. Afterwards, if the server is crashed, I want some information. Uh, it's not very useful just to have like 10,000 network data, um, replays which make the server crash, but you also have to have some information. I collected a lot of information, but basically what you really need is the stack trace to know which function, uh, at which line it crashed and what were the previous functions. So this is also useful then to make um, the minimization of all the crashes. 
First, I used the Python ptrace library. This was awful. It didn't work. It crashed. It had bad backtraces. Uh, so then I created a parser for the address sanitizer log files. Basically, address sanitizer doesn't really sanitize addresses, but adds code so you can um, identify heap-based buffer overflows and stuff like this. Uh, like you've seen before in GDB, it makes beautiful output where exactly the, the overflow happened. But this was not for a stack. Um, buffer overflows. So now I'm starting in the verify phase. I start the server in GDB and replay the, the network data which made it crash and then parse the output of GDB and try to extract the stack trace. So um, the previous stuff, the man in the middle stuff, the sending and mutating data was very simple, it was like done in four days, but like uh, the, the trouble was in developing fussing for worms more in other areas, like uh, this stack trace parsing or restarting of the server or identifying is the server really crashed or not. Uh, I like hardware, so I bought myself some uh, CPU power to fuss a bit more professionally. Uh, Xeon E5 from 2012, uh, it has like eight cores, so with a hyper-threading 16 threads and parallel and 32 gigs of RAM and uh, this double, so you have one here and one here, so you have like 40 max of cache and 64 gigs of RAM and all this with the CPU coolers and power supply and the RAM, it was like $700, it was awesome. So I just needed the case and the SSD. But sadly, what I really needed was more something like this. If there is, uh, if there are really vulnerabilities in the network servers I tested, I identified them very quickly, like after half a minute or a minute. So all this power was not really necessary. Um, but my server was fussing, it heated up my um, office, but somehow I thought, uh, this is not very smart. I'm not a step closer to a fully automatic um, AI which uh, hacks other people or something like this. It's, it's just uh, mutating, completely dump the, the, the network traffic, look if the server is crashed and then does it again. But maybe we could make it smarter. <clears throat> and we can make it smarter, uh, especially with this technique, with feedback-driven fuzzing. What we want, basically, that if we identify like uh, uh, we fuss something, we change some values, make, maybe making a, uh, the number one to a number two, and suddenly we find new functionality. Uh, we want to store this, uh, this corpus, which led to here, x2. So then we can use it as a basis to continue our fussing. Maybe find um, bugs much deeper into the program and explore all the possible states, or a large amount of the possible states. Um, and the normal fuzzer, a dump fuzzer, just mutates it and maybe it randomly reaches this location, but it's all um, by accident. Um, usually we don't not only want to do this on function level, but on basic block level. So basic block is what you always see in IDA. Uh, once entered in a basic block, the execution will continue until the end. And then it's again changing to a new basic block, as you can see here. So all the control, control flow is between the basic blocks. And every function consists of at least one basic block. So we can use this to really explore the whole state of a target server. For example, here we have a comparison, we have a crash if uh, the input is A, B, C, D. And 
this was more or less um, made popular by A AFL. You have this bloom filter here. And if you use AFL GCC, the AFL compiler, the compiler will add like three lines of code after each basic block, which will update one value in this bloom filter. So if we reach this basic block, it will write increment this um, number here. Uh, we fuss some more. Maybe now the input at the second place is now B. Then uh, it changes this bit or byte to be more precise. And the fuzzer will always send some data to the target program and compare this bloom filter with the previous one. And if there's one little difference, one more number one, then it knows are oh, the input um, made um, called a new function, a new basic block in the target. Um, and with this, instead of uh, like brute forcing a value of 32 bits, it's is 4 billion possibilities, you can just have to um, guess four times one byte. So it's just like a thousand possibilities. So it's much more efficient to search through the space with the feedback driven fuzzing. Um, this will look like this at the end in the source code. I think this was generated with Elkov and Gcov, but, but it's basically the same. Once you have these different comp corpuses exercising different functionality of the program, you can um, resend all of them and then paint uh, your source code, like which ifs and which elses have been reached by the fuzzer and which one not and then improve uh, the fuzzer or the fuzzing technique. This method is surprisingly uh, efficient. So um, it was a test with AFL, uh, JPEG parser uh, has been fast with just writing hello into a file. So it's basically just an invalid JPEG file. Uh, let AFL run for some time and step by step it like reverse engineered the JPEG um, specifications and it generated more or less valid images just by brute forcing it through the search space of the JPEG parser, which I think is pretty cool. So I wanted to have this for fussing for worms and I was googling a little bit uh, what is available and I found this page here from Honkfoss where it was a little bit um, some explanation what different functionality to you have nowadays to perform this uh, code coverage feedback. Um, hardware, uh, you can use hardware like Intel BTS and Intel PT Intel PT is the newer one. I think it's available since more or less Skylake and used in KAFL KA to FOSS uh, operating systems, but also all the current um, compilers like GCC and Clang already have the support to add this code coverage mechanism into the code. So I was inspired a little bit by Honkfoss. I started to, I think I randomly selected one of these, tried to implement it by myself um, and copied more and more code of Honkfoss into Fossing for Worms um, until I realized uh, even if I, after weeks or whatever, made it to work, uh, still uh, like Honkfoss, from Google is um, has like all these cool code coverage techniques and I'm always lagging behind. Um, why am I not using Honkfoss itself? Uh, by the way, is Robert Zwicky here? The author, author of Honkfoss? Okay. Anyway, um, so basically I instrumentalized Honkfoss that it's not really fussing but just using it as an oracle for um, code coverage. So Honkfoss will uh, observe the target 
FFV will communicate with Hongfoss via Unix domain socket, and it will also send the networked data di directly to the target. Uh, very too slow or too fast. Um, so then it's a simple protocol. Um, Hongfoss will tell fossing for worms, hey, please do some fossing. Fossing for worms will send uh, mutated data to the target, and Hongfoss will either say, uh, uh, then we say, yeah, we send our shit to the target, our TCP data, and then Hongfoss will say, yeah, you reach the new basic block, and then fossing for worms will add what it sent to the corpus, or it says, yeah, it, the target is crashed. And it's very good, we uh, handle this, or most of the time nothing happens, and just saying again, please fuss some more. So this is my second demo. So they patched my uh, vulnerability in Mungu 6.9 and was thinking maybe there are some more vulnerabilities. And of course there are. Um, I already prepared everything. So basically you can just start FFV with a honk mode parameter. I have here two threads. Uh, it starts with two corpus files, and already in a few seconds, uh, I generated 16 auto corpuses, which are depending on other, um, on two parents. And it's quite interesting to see. Yeah, maybe make this one big. So all the corpuses, all the, um, Newly generated files are stored in a file system, and you can see how it's um, advancing. So here it fast the second message, found a new basic block, then uh, fast based on that one, the first message, found a new basic block, and so it's going deeper and deeper and finding more and more functionality of this MQTT server. Until I reach the uh, file name limit of Linux. I think it's about 255 characters. Uh, I have to speed up a little bit. The most important part, uh, how performant is this thing? And it's not very fast. It's about 30 iterations per thread. So, um, this includes uh, reading the stored corpus, selecting a message, mutate it with Radamsa, then create a TCP connection, send all the packets, read all the answers, and then it's next iteration. So in AFL, it's usually recommended to use half your core count as uh, active threads. On FFV, uh, it's basically the server is just most of the time um, setting up and probably tearing down TCP connections, so it's waiting all the time. So you can use core count multiplied by two. Uh, with my machine, it's about 2,000 iterations per second, which is about as much as AFL signal threaded. So it's kind of okay. Um, but just having, at the beginning, I had this 30 iterations per second, which was very bad, so I had to have multiple fussing processes. Uh, this also generated a surprisingly large problem, because you have to tell the server, hey, uh, every server needs to listen to on another port. Not all MQTT servers can listen on port 1883. So some servers uh, use it via command line, then you have servers which have configuration files like IOC servers, uh, then you just prepare like uh, 100 configuration files with different ports and then give this as specifications in the command line. But all this was very bad. And I stole an idea, brilliant idea of also Honk Foss, uh, uh, and it's um, Linux network namespaces. 
uh, as, are, as everyone knows, network namespaces is also used in like LXC and LXD and Docker and all that stuff. It simulates um, a new, completely independ independent network interface for a certain amount of processes. I can say from now on, I want to have a new network namespace, then you have your own loopback device, and then you can, without having any configuration changes on the server, to have arbitrarily many servers fussing in parallel without them uh, killing each other. So we have the master process communicating with a queue to the slave, which is communicating with a Unix domain socket to Honkfoss, which is uh, via shared memory getting this code, key, code coverage of the server. I send TCP data to the server and then send basically just statistics back to the master. Um, all slaves um, observe the corpus directory so if one of the slaves find a new um, input which, which exercises new basic blocks, it just stores it in the directory. All the authors get notified by uh, iNotify and they add it to their corpus and everyone always have all the possible um, states, which is pretty cool. So uh, that is how it was working. Uh, Fossil is only as good as it can produce results. So I tested it a little bit. I was a bit more developing than testing. So there are not so many results. But of course I found, found the initial bug in Mongoose MQTT 6.8 and then in 6.9. I found in libcope and all these nice <clears throat> IoT libraries. And usually uh, found the bugs pretty fast. They're all available in a Docker image, and I didn't have time to notify the maintainers. So if somebody wants to have some free CVs, can download the Docker image, do some fussing, and uh, get famous. Um, interestingly, like the Mongoose Web DNS and DHCP uh, protocols, uh, just fasted for like half an hour, but it was no box. And I think it's also because these are like simple protocols and easy to test, so without state. Maybe someone tested it again already with AFL. I tried Synergy, this was awful, it didn't work at all, as expected. And surprisingly, all the IRC servers, I also haven't detected a, a crash. Uh, here's some more statistics. So I had a bug. I let it run with eight threads, but every thread just executed one iteration per second. So we have here eight iterations per second. Um, but we still see on the bottom, like this are the amount of basic blocks, of the unique basic blocks we identified, and it's growing slowly but steadily over a week. So I think this was like one week. Uh, this is from AFL, AFL plot. I made the output of FFV compatible, so I can also make fancy, nice graphs. Oh yes, this was the server Inspire IRCD. I fast another IRC server, NG IRCD. Here it was working more proper, properly. It's surprising that it gets slower at the beginning. Um, whatever, it was about 120 iterations per second, and also here I reached after two days about two and a half thousand basic blocks. So it's really crunching through the search space of the IOC server. So the conclusion, um, fussing for worms, it can intercept network data, it will retransmit it with a little bit of fuzzing and it detecting crashes and new basic blocks. Um, the motivation was like, or as I've seen, or as I've seen now, it's way too slow to do some 
really serious fuzzing. You want to have performance like AFL with like 10 or 20,000 iterations per second, which is like 100 times faster than uh, fuzzing for worms. So you find box 100 times quicker. But this will always need some modification of the target server, some code modification, uh, debugging and reverse engineering. So I think fuzzing for worms is useful at the beginning. Just um, intercept some data, start to fuss. It's uh, set up in like 10 minutes. And in the four hours which you need to patch the target to make it AFL compatible, maybe Fossing for Worms already found some bugs and you're writing CVs instead of patching servers. As Chris Bisnet said, always be fussing. Um, so if, uh, yeah, like what I previously said, should not have wasted time, always be some something to fuss. Maybe you find some bugs, maybe not. And even if it's just a stupid dumb fusser, maybe it gets lucky and finds something. So the code is on GitHub. I'm on Twitter. I write a little bit about some problems uh, in my blog. I also have the Docker container, uh, which you can download. And I'm also on Reddit on fussing, which is um, has all the new fussing technologies, but not much discussion. So come and say hi. And I think I'm perfectly in time surprisingly, and available for questions. Beautiful. Hey, thank you very much. Got to love the Swiss efficiency on that. Um, yeah, so we have a final few minutes, I think, available for a bit of questions. So does anyone have any questions that we would like to have? I know it's the last session. I know our brains are probably dead and full of info. Anyone, anything? No? Oh, letting you off easy. You are. Last talk and <laughs> you get easy. Great. You can talk with me afterwards. <laughs> Just find me. Awesome. Okay, cool. Hey, guys, thank you very much. I guess that concludes all the talks for this year's con, so thank you very much. Uh, we still have a final closing ceremony happening in around 10 minutes now, so please don't go away just yet. Uh, you can take a little break now, grab a refreshment, and then we should meet back here in around 10 minutes for 4 o'clock for the closing ceremony. Thank you. <laughs>